uh, Genesis chapter 30, verses 25 through 43, we're working our way through uh, uh, selected texts in, in uh, the life of the, uh, the patriarch Jacob, and so uh, we dealt with a couple of texts in uh, chapter 28, two sections in 28, we're we're continuing now, we're fast-forwarding a bit, we're beginning uh, today our reading in chapter 30 and, verses, uh, and verse 25. Now it came about when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said to Laban, send me away that I may go to my own place in my own country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you and let me now depart. For you yourself know my service, which I have rendered to you. But Laban said to him, If now it pleases you, stay with me. I have divined that the Lord has blessed me on your account. And he continued, Name me your wages, and I will give it. But he said to him, You yourself know how I have served you, and how your cattle have fared with me. For you had little before I came, and it has increased a multitude, and the Lord has blessed you wherever I turn. But now, when shall I provide for my own household also? So he said, What shall I give you? Jacob said, If you will, give me, if you will not give me anything, you shall not give me anything, rather. If you, if you will give me this one, if you'll do this one thing for me, I will again pasture and keep your flock. Let me pass through your entire flock today, removing from there every speckled and spotted sheep and every black among the lambs and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and such shall be my wages. So my honesty will answer for me later when you come concerning my wages. Everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and the black among the lambs, if it is found with me, will be considered stolen. Jacob said, let it be according to your word. So he removed that day the striped and the spotted male goats and all the speckled and spotted female goats, every one with the white in it, all the black ones among the sheep, and gave them into the care of his sons. And he put a distance of three days between himself and Jacob. And Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. Then Jacob took two fresh rods of poplar and almond and plane trees and peeled white strips in them exposing the white which was in the rods. And he set the rods which he had peeled in front of the flocks in gutters, even in the watering troughs where the flock came to drink. And they mated when they came to drink. So the flocks mated by the rods, and the flocks brought forth speckled, striped, uh, brought forth striped, speckled, and spotted. And Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face toward the striped and all the black in the flock of Laban. And he put his own herds apart and did not put them with Laban's flock. Moreover, it came about when, whenever the stronger the flock were mating that Jacob would place the rods in the side of the flock uh, in the gutters so that they may mate by the rods. But when the flock was feeble, he did not put them in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger were Jacob's. So the man became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks and female and male servants and camels and donkeys. Grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please, as we turn to our a hymn of preparation, number 101 in the Trinity Hymnal.
Amen. Your loving kindness, O Lord, is great to the heavens. Your truth reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O Lord, above the heavens and your glory over all the earth. Be exalted, O Lord, and be glorified in our midst through the preaching and the hearing of Holy Scripture. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The Genesis narrative dealing with the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob takes up nearly half of the 50 chapters of this book. It's worth asking why so much space has been devoted to the accounts of these three patriarchs. And whatever the entire explanation may be in God's wisdom, chief among the reasons that we're given so much detail about these patriarchs and these accounts is that these saints of God are illustrations of a fundamental recurring motif or theme in the Genesis account, namely the life of faith. There's a central theme in Genesis that's repeated several times and then repeated climactically again in the Exodus account. And that central theme is what we have in our text today. It's what's being elaborated upon once again built upon, developed a further illustration of the life of God's covenant people, uh, the life of those who have believed. Details of these narratives serve to emphasize this recurring theme. And here is this central theme in summary. Jacob here is summoned to leave Padan Aram to go to Canaan, and when he does so, he nearly retraces the pilgrimage of his grandfather, Abraham, the one that Abraham had made so many years ago from Haran to Canaan. It was a summons that had to be answered in faith. Israel will later be called to leave Egypt for the land of Canaan. And upon this journey of faith, upon the journey of faith to which God calls all of his people, superior enemies or significant obstacles are arrayed against God's people in every case, threatening to prevent the pilgrimage of faith, the very pilgrimage to which they've been called. In Abraham's case, it's, it's the, uh, the famine and the Egyptians. In Jacob's case, it's Laban and Esau. And in Israel, it will be the Egyptians and the wilderness. And in each of these three cases, not only does God deliver his people from these enemies or obstacles, but they come away from this experience, this journey, having plundered their enemies. Abraham came out of Egypt a, a wealthy man. Jacob leaves Padan Aram a wealthy man, and Israel plunders the, the Egyptians on their way out of the land of her slavery. The cycles of history the cycles of, of biblical history, the cycles of the history of these patriarchs, as we read, for example, in Hebrews 11, uh, is, it, is intended to, to set a pattern to show us the nature of the Christian faith. The detail, the repetitiveness, all adds weight to the lesson. It makes the picture being painted more vivid, 
It makes it more impressive to us. Children, does this idea of, uh, of a journey of faith remind you of another old story? Doesn't it remind you of Pilgrim's progress? Pilgrim and all of the obstacles that he faced on the way to the celestial city, on the, on the way to heaven itself. And yet God delivered him, didn't he? And why, why, that, why that theme in Pilgrim's Progress? Where did John Bunyan get that theme? Well, he got that theme in the very passages that we're, we're talking about today in the lives of these, of these patriarchs and God's great deliverance of Israel out of, of Egypt. And so God calls us, God calls every believer, God calls you to embark on a lifelong journey of faith with the expectation that in spite of enemies, in spite of obstacles, in spite of weakness of faith, he will deliver you to that final and glorious destination of heaven, and he will prosper you along the way. We'll look at four things here in, in our text. In the first place, the believer is called to fix his eyes upon the promised land. Secondly, enemies or obstacles block the believer's journey to the promised land. Thirdly, the, belie the believer stumbles uh, in unbelief. And fourth, God nevertheless protects and prospers the believer. So first, along the journey of faith, you are called to fix your eyes resolutely on the promised land. It's a call to trust, tr to trust God for the unseen, the unrealized, and the uncertain uh, in our lives. Abraham had to exercise faith, didn't he, when, when God called him uh, out of Haran to go to Canaan. He didn't know where he was going. Israel had to exercise faith when leaving e Egypt because of the, all the uncertainties of the, the journey that they were about to embark upon. Jacob had to exercise faith in going back home because Esau awaited him there. It's a call to leave our, our current place and to sojourn in the promised land. God told Abraham to leave Haran to, uh, to sojourn in the land of Canaan. He told Israel to leave uh, Egypt, and to go to the promised land. In our text, Jacob was being drawn back to the land that, that God had promised to give him. He starts out well. He has his eyes in the right place, but he allowed himself to, to be dissuaded. He took his eyes off God's covenant promises. And all of the patriarchs died without receiving the land of of promise. And yet they understood that there was something beyond the land. How do we know that? Well, we read in Hebrews chapter 11 that Abraham was looking for the city whose architect and builder is God and that all of them desired a heavenly country. The journey of faith is a calling to believe in the unseen God to live and to live as though what's been promised has already been received. That's how the, the writer of Hebrews, remember, defines faith in, uh, in early on in, in that uh, 11th chapter of, of Hebrews. Faith, he says, is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is setting our eyes, setting our eyes on the certainties that God has promised to us, even though they're not yet realized. And part of the journey is 
having our eyes set upon that goal of faith and upon the promised land that we know that Abraham understood was a promise of heaven itself. And so that we have our eyes set upon heaven itself as our, our great reward and Christ himself as the ultimate reward. Remember Ephesians 2, verse 6, Paul describes the believers having been raised up with Christ and already seated with him in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And then in Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2, the apostle directs those who, who have been raised up with Christ to keep seeking and to set their minds on the things above, not on things of the things that are on the earth. But to set their, their, their minds on heavenly things, set their minds on eternal things, because that's where Christ is. Christ himself is our great prize in heaven. This is what one a well-known uh, theologian refers to as the already and the not yet of Scripture. Because we're united to Christ by faith, the Bible says that we already possess certain realities. And why is that? It's because they're so certain. It's because God has set things into motion in the lives of his people, and they cannot fail because God cannot fail. So he, he, the Bible tells us that we possess certain realities as, as believers, and then it tells us to to live our lives out of that certainty, to direct our energies to eternal things, the things that pertain, pertain to our heavenly calling, and not the things of this world. And the writer to the Hebrews uh, will go on in chapter 12 to describe this this journey of faith in which every believer in Jesus Christ is engaged as a race. And he says, in this race, we are to fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who endured the cross, scorned its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. Jesus, who has already made the round trip from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven, we're to fix our eyes upon him seated in the heavenly places and we're to follow the resoluteness of his example. And so in the first place then, we are being taught here in the life of the patriarch Jacob to fix our eyes resolutely on the promised land of heaven. But then secondly, along this journey of faith, as we look at the lives of Abraham, uh, especially Abraham, uh, the life of, of Isaac as well, of Jacob, as we look at the history of Israel, uh, superior enemies or significant ob obstacles block our way to uh, the promised land. For, for Abraham, it was, uh, you remember the detour to Egypt, God's providence, there was a famine a severe famine during, during Abraham's stay in the Promised Land. So he went down to Egypt to sojourn there. And the sojourn in Egypt became a stumbling block to him. For Israel, it was Pharaoh and his army, and, and then the wilderness. God sent Moses and Aaron to, to Pharaoh, let my people go, but he hardened Pharaoh's heart. And after uh, Pharaoh finally released his, his grip upon God's people uh, by the plagues, he again hardened Pharaoh's hearts, uh, heart so that he, he chased Israel with, uh, with his army. And then having drowned Pharaoh's army in, the, in, the, in the, the, the Red Sea, God released his people in the wilderness. But the wilderness became a stumbling block to Israel. For Jacob, it was Laban. Laban was a crafty man. He'd already dealt deceitfully with Jacob. Remember giving him 
uh, Leah on his wedding night rather than uh, Rachel, whom he'd promised to serve uh, seven years for. And Laban uh, knows that he's prospered because Jacob has been with him. And so uh, when, when Jacob approaches him and says, uh, give me all that I've, I've earned, these my wives, all that I've earned these uh, these 14 years that I've, I've served you for, uh, for Leah and, and now for Rachel, give me my wages so that I can depart and return to uh, the, the promised land, to return home. And Laban says, name your wages. Sounds like a, a, very, uh, a very generous offer. But we learn... Uh, later, in Exodus, uh, Genesis 31, rather, that uh, Laban changed Jacob's wages ten times. So Jacob offers a, a proposal in verses 32 and 33 that sounds entirely to, to uh, Laban's advantage. It's rare to get a black sheep or speckled goats, so it, it looks like a great deal. For Laban, and it's made even better by Jacob's offer to to cleanse the gene pool of speckled animals and uh, and dark sheep at 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 the uh, the outset. Laban not only takes Jacob off uh, on the the offer here to to cleanse the gene pool, but being a cheat himself, he takes the extra precaution uh, in verse thirty five and thirty six to remove. All the, the speckled and spotted goats and sheep from the flock gives them to his own sons and puts a distance of three days' journey between, uh, between them and the rest of the flock to prevent any inbreeding between them so that there wouldn't be any speckled or spotted and black animals. It's a kind of, it's just a kind of thing that Jacob is, is up against. He's up against a, a crafty and a, a cunning man. And that's the life of faith, isn't it? It's a life of faith that, that we live. Every believer has a crafty and a cunning enemy in the devil himself. And there are detours to Egypt along with Pharaoh's and Laban's in every believer's life which become obstacles in his pilgrimage of faith. Different for every believer. The world itself is a great and terrible wilderness with fiery serpents and scorpions and a thirsty ground with no water. There are Labans around every corner, it would seem. Why does God put these enemies in our way? Why does he put these significant obstacles in our way. Well, he says to, uh, through Moses in Deuteronomy 8 that he, he did this to Israel to humble them, to test them, to see whether or not they would obey their God. And we know James tells us as well that he does so uh, to, that he puts these trials in, in our paths for our endurance to cause us to endure in the faith, to produce endurance in us. So God calls you to this journey. And then along the path of faith, superior enemies or significant obstacles block your pilgrimage to the promised land. And then what happens? Along the journey of faith, the believer stumbles in unbelief. Abraham didn't trust God to protect him in Egypt, and so he represented Sarah as his sister, who was then taken into Pharaoh's harem. And in doing so, he put her chastity at risk and threatened the covenant seed. Israel didn't 
trust God to deliver them from Pharaoh or to provide for them in the wilderness. So when they heard the hoofbeats of, of the Egyptian horses and uh, the, the loud roar of the chariot wheels, the sound of Pharaoh's marching army, they complained to Moses, is, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out here into the wilderness? And then once they'd been delivered from Pharaoh, they complained in the desert and they questioned God. Can God set a table in the wilderness for his people? Will he really feed us? Will he really provide for us? Jacob didn't trust God to, prepare, to, to protect him from, from Laban or to prosper him in his sojourn. He thought he knew a way to make the white sheep have speckled and spotted young, the white of the flock uh, to, to have speckled and spotted offspring. So he took rods of green poplar and almond and chestnut, and he peeled white strips in, in these branches, in these sticks. Can, can you picture that? The bark on the, the branches is green or it's brown, but he peels off the bark so the white underneath is exposed. We've all done this as children, perhaps even as adults we've done this, to, to peel the bark off of a branch or the, the bark off of a, a, a stick. What are, what are they supposed to look like then? They're supposed to look like the fleece of a sheep or a goat that's speckled or spotted. And he set these speckled and spotted robs and, uh, rods in front of the, the flocks when they came to mate. And what's the reason? Or the reasoning here? When the flocks mate, there'll be this vision before their eyes and this idea uh, in their heads, sheep, mind you, of speckled and spotted, speckled and spotted. And so, of course, they'll conceive speckled and spotted young. And as it turns out, they did. And so Jacob separated all the speckled and spotted. They belong to him. He has a mate with each other in order to produce more speckled and spotted. And meanwhile, he takes Laban's flocks and, and he makes sure that they're mating and they're looking at the speckled and the spot. And we learn from verse 41 uh, that he did this all selectively. He didn't he just let any old uh, sheep or goat come and, and mate before the speckled and spotted branches, but he made sure they were the strong of the flock. So only the strong bore speckled and spotted. And Jacob ended up with the strong flock and Laban with the weak. What's Jacob doing? It's just like the, man, the mandrakes in the first section of this 30th chapter. Remember how, how Rachel wanted uh, these mandrakes and she struck a deal with, uh, with her sister because they were thought to give fertility to those who ate them. And it's that kind of superstitiousness in which uh, Jacob is engaging here, making them uh, the, the, the flocks made in front of speckled and spotted rods in the troughs. He did not understand how fully all of this was in the Lord's hands. He thinks that he's somehow manipulating the outcome. But in doing so, he's robbed of a blessing. And so, too, you and I, on this journey of faith, are robbed of the blessing when we take things into our own hands. And we try to manipulate the circumstances instead of trusting God for the outcome. How weak our faith is. How often we take matters into our own hands, or at least attempt to take them in our own hands. 
instead of trusting the Lord. That's not to say, of course, that there's no room for, for planning. There's no room for prudence uh, in this life. On the part of, of those who are on this journey of faith, it's rather a clear message that a believer plans his steps, but the outcome is in the hands of the Lord. The outcome belongs to the Lord. We need to be trusting God along this journey of faith. So, there are the first three steps as the believer is along uh, this journey of faith, as he's setting, setting his eyes to the promised land. Uh, enemies or obstacles block our way. Instead of trusting the Lord for the outcome, we... Instead, in the weakness of our faith, begin to trust in the arm of the flesh. And then fourthly, and finally, along the journey of faith, God nevertheless protects and prospers believers. He protected, he prospered Abraham in Egypt. It was Pharaoh, remember, not Abraham that the Lord struck with a plague for taking Sarah into his harem. And Abraham left Egypt with livestock and servants in tow. God protected uh, Egypt, uh, rather protected uh, Israel in Egypt. He delivered his people out of Egypt from uh, Pharaoh's clutches. They, and remember, they plundered the Egyptians in the Exodus. And then the, the Lord engulfed Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. He provided manna and quail and water from the rock in the wilderness. Their clothing, remember, did not wear out on them 40 years in the wilderness. And the Lord routed their enemies before them in the land of Canaan. He protected Jacob and he prospered Jacob in Padan Aram. Jacob left his mother's homeland a wealthy man. That's the last thing that our, our text tells us. He became exceedingly prosperous. He had large flocks, female, male servants, and camels, and, and donkeys. He didn't deserve any of it. He took his eyes off the goal, and his faith wavered. But God kept his promise, and he protected Jacob, and he prospered Jacob, and he brought him back to the land of promise. And what are we saying here then? You know this principle as the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. That doctrine that Paul expresses in the first chapter of Philippians, I'm confident, confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. And so, a question before us today is whether or not we believe that. Do you believe that? You believe that God has promised in spite of these enemies, these significant obstacles, do you believe that in spite of the weakness of your faith and your stumblings and your bumblings before him, that he will nevertheless protect and prosper you. We must believe that because God has promised it, hasn't he? And we must always be praying then, always remembering to pray as we believe, Lord, increase our faith. Lord, I believe. Help me when I stumble in unbelief. God calls you to embark on a lifelong journey of faith. And notwithstanding enemies and obstacles and weakness of faith, he preserves and he prospers you in that journey. And this life is established in the lives of the, the patriarchs, 
in the life of the, the nation of Israel. It's repeated for us, all of these details and the reiteration of this theme in the Bible is designed so that we might see and so that we might follow the example that God has set before us in the patriarchs. How many times and how many ways is this pattern repeated for us? How many times, for example, is Israel's history in the wilderness, in their deliverance from, from Egypt and their, their history in the wilderness and, and their unbelief and God nevertheless delivering them out of of their own sin and unbelief. How many times is that repeated for us? You see that pattern over and over. Again, for example, in Psalm 106, uh, verses 9 to 12, just for example, uh, shows what God uh, did for them. He rebuked the Red Sea, dried it up. He led them through the, uh, the deeps as through the, the wilderness. He saved them from the hand of, of the one who hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemies and the water covered their adversaries. Not one of them was left. Then they believed his words and they, they sang his praise. That's what God does, doesn't he? He, he does this for his people. But then uh, verses 13 and 14 tell us how they stumble uh, in this path, in this journey of faith. They, they quickly forgot his works. They didn't wait on his counsel. They craved intensely in the wilderness. They tempted God in the desert so that he gave them the request and sent a wasting disease among them. And they sinned against God. And his anger was kindled against them, verse 40 says. But then you notice how this psalm uh, climaxes here, verses 44 and through 46. Nevertheless, he looked on their distress when he heard their cry, he remembered his covenant for their sake. He relented according to the greatness of his loving kindness. He also made them objects of compassion in the presence of all their captors. What are we being told? Again, it's this pattern of this journey of faith. It's this pattern of the enemies and the obstacles and the weakness of faith, stumblings in faith, and the God who delivers us in spite of all of these things. And you and I are on that same journey, not to Canaan, but to heaven itself to, to, to collect our great prize of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have adversaries arrayed against us, but we have a God who has promised to protect us, to deliver us, and to prosper us. It may not seem like that, Indeed, often it does not seem like that to us in our journey. After all, Jacob was in Padan Aram for 20 years and had to endure a great deal of mistreatment during those years. Israel would be in Egypt for 100 years and slavery. They'd suffer terribly in their sojourn there. But at the end, it was just as God had promised. For Abraham, for Isaac, for Jacob, and for Israel. And these things happened to the patriarchs. And they happened to Israel on their journey of faith as an example to us, Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, an example upon, uh, to us upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And what else does this mean? What else does Paul mean when he speaks of what Israel did in the wilderness and their the weakness of their faith and their unbelief and their grumbling against God. When Paul comes to that section and he applies these things concerning the life of Israel to God's people, and he warns us, let he who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. What does that mean 
except that when these examples are placed before the believer, that you are to live out this journey of faith as those who are living post the incarnation and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing our enemy better, knowing the pitfalls of our faith better, and trusting in the promise of God to protect us and to prosper us until we reach our eternal resting place, until we receive that prize of the glorious Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, Lord our God, As we read these things over again and again in the scriptures, we are humbled in this journey to which you've called us, humbled by the knowledge, the greater knowledge that you've given us as those who are upon whom the ends of the ages have come, those who have a greater understanding of, of the revelation of your will and that through Jesus, our Savior, his coming, his, his life, his death, his resurrection, his exaltation. And we are ashamed at how often our faith stumbles, how we repeat the pattern, the weakness of faith in our, that, we've, that we see again and again. And so we call on you, O Lord, knowing that apart from your grace, we cannot walk this path. We cannot set our minds resolutely on uh, heavenly things, eternal things. We cannot live out of the certainty of the reality that you've given us in your word unless you strengthen us by your grace. We pray, O oh Lord, we believe these promises. Help us, O oh Lord. Increase our faith. Help us in our unbelief. Help us when we stumble in our faith. We ask in Christ's name, amen. amen. Let's stand together as we...